trying to distract us, Father. Please, Lord, may your holy angels be victorious. May we not think, think of the things of this world, especially at such an hour as this. But, Lord, may we be focused on Christ and your righteousness, Lord. We ask and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I encourage you to turn with me your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 24. Matthew 20, 24. We have a little bit of... Can we turn the mics off, the other mics? Matthew, chapter 24, as we open up the Word of God today. Are you getting an echo? Yes. This one's off. Still an echo? No. All right. Matthew 24, brothers and sisters. Matthew chapter 24, and I'm going to begin in verse 3. Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to begin today's study in verse 3. The Word of God says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, Now as he, that's Jesus, sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. You know, brothers and sisters, in just the last 10 years, we have seen all these things come to pass. Isn't that right? We have seen major earthquakes in many places. Chile, Haiti, Japan, Indonesia. I need not focus on all the death and destruction. But you know, one good thing out of this passage, brothers and sisters, is that Jesus said when all these things come to pass, all, even though all these bad things are happening, one good thing is going to happen. And that good thing is that Jesus is coming very soon. Amen? And very soon, God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things that passed away. Can you imagine? You turn on the news in heaven, and they say, no one has died today. No crime. No death. No suffering. Amen? Amen. Don't you want to go to heaven, brothers and sisters? You know, all these things, you know, Jesus is coming very soon, but he is waiting on one thing. Do you know Jesus is waiting for one thing? There's a reason why Jesus has not yet come. In fact, a good summary of this is found in the book Christ's Object Lessons, page 69, when it says, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. You know, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have been waiting many years for the soon return of Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? But do you know, brothers and sisters, that even though we have been waiting so long, in reality, Jesus Christ has been waiting for us. <laughs> do you know that Jesus has been waiting for us to put sin out of our lives? to be transformed by his grace so that when he comes, we may be ready. In fact, this is just a, a, an echo of the book of 2 Peter chapter 3, which we're not going to go to today, but it tells that Jesus is long-suffering and he is waiting for us to be ready. And so, Christ is waiting for us. You know, he is waiting for a revival and a reformation to occur in our church. And the book, Selected Messages, uh, book one, tells us that a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. You know, when I think of becoming just like Jesus, I know that I need a revival. We need a revival. Amen? But the question is, where does revival begin? Have you ever wondered that? I'm sure you've heard of sermons before about revival and reformation, but where does a genuine revival begin? Does it begin 
up in the pulpit when we hear powerful sermons from Pastor Rossetti and Pastor Alvin? Is that, is that where a genuine revival will begin? Or perhaps it's in tithes and love offerings. If we only give a little bit more, then revival will occur. Or maybe it's missionary trips to the Philippines. Amen? Now, all these things are good things. Isn't that right? But where does genuine revival begin? This is from the Spirit of Prophecy. It says, The well-being of society, the success of the church, the prosperity of the nation, depend upon... What do you think? Say it a little bit louder. It's all right. What do you think? Someone said numbers. Anyone else want to venture a guess? The, the well-being of society, the, the success of the church, the prosperity of the nation depend upon... Depends upon, brothers and sisters, home influences. <laughs> home influences. The success of the church depends upon home influences. Let's confirm that with the Bible. Let's go to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 3. As we confirm this statement through the Bible, that the success of the church, true, genuine revival and reformation, begins in the home. 1 Timothy, chapter 3. And I will begin, verse 1. All the T's are together. And... Um, when you're there, please say amen. All right. 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Are you there? Amen. All right. The book of 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 says, This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. And then look at verse 5, brothers and sisters. It says, For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of of the church of God. And so here the apostle writes that, look, we need to get home matters right first before we can even reach the world, right? How can you share the love of God if you don't have love in the home? Isn't that right? <laughs> and so a genuine revival must begin in the home. Now, what is the pattern that we must follow? If you could think of a, a perfect family, a perfect human family, in the Bible, where would you go? Let's go to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. You know, Adam and Eve, before sin, they were perfect, isn't that right? And Genesis 1-1 tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We know that. And then if you continue to read through Genesis 1, it tells us that uh, God created Adam, Adam and Eve on the sixth day, and then he created the Sabbath on the seventh, or he rested from his works. And if you look in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, Genesis 2-25, Speaking of Adam and Eve, it says in Genesis 2.25, it says, They were both naked, the man and his girlfriend, and were not ashamed. Wife, right? The man and his wife, and were not ashamed, right? Um, you know, you cannot have a wife unless you have a marriage. Isn't that right? And so, when did marriage occur? Did it occur before sin or after sin? Before sin, you're right on that again, brothers and sisters, amen? And here's a takeaway point, is because the first marriage was before sin, do you realize that when God created marriage, he created it and desired that um, the marriage institution should be completely free from arguments and bitterness. Do you know that? Because Adam and Eve didn't fight in the book of Genesis chapter 1. Do you realize that? And so the perfect pattern, what God desires in the home, is perfect love. Amen? And so if we want to claim revival, we must first experience restoration in our families. But what is true love? You know, it doesn't matter if you're single or divorced or um, married. It doesn't matter, matter if you're, you're 10 or 50 years old. We need to have love in our hearts, right? So what is true love? Let's go to the Bible to find out. 
Please turn with your Bibles to the scripture reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, as we discover what is true love, because you know what? We use the word love all the time. I could say, I love this sandwich, and I love my wife. Now, hopefully, I love my wife more than the sandwich. Isn't that right? And so, the Bible tells us what true love is, because you know what? In Hollywood today, often what is termed love is actually lust, if you think about it. So the Bible tells us, brothers and sisters, what true love is. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, it says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, Jesus Christ proved that true love is not selfish, but it is selfless, right? And we've read this verse before, right? We're familiar with this. We hear this in weddings. We hear this in sermons, amen? And um, we say, we know this brother will already, right? We know what true love is. But let's go a little bit deeper, shall we, in these verses, because the Bible tells us that God is love, and here the Bible says that love is patient. So what that is telling us is that this verse is really describing the characteristics of God. And so if you look, take a look at this verse again, it actually is telling us that God is patient, God is kind, God does not envy, God does not boast, God is not proud, God is not rude, God is not self-seeking, God is not easily angered. God does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. God always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. The Lord never fails. Amen? You know, here God, he's, he's the creator of heaven and earth. He has the perfect right to be whatever he wants. Yet God is the perfect representation of love. Amen? You know, the Bible also tells us in the book of 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, that Whoever claims to be Christ must walk as Jesus walked. Isn't that right? And so if God is patient, God is kind, then we can look at this verse and we can also see how close we are to Jesus Christ. In fact, if you read it again, it says, Are you patient? Are you kind? Do you envy? Do you boast? Are you proud? Are you rude? Are you self-seeking? Are you easily angered? Do you keep a record of wrongs? Are you following Jesus Christ? Do you see, brothers and sisters, that we need a deeper love experience with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? In fact, if you continue to, as we're learning about what true love is, because we need to know what true love is before we can experience it in the home, if you look back up to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, here the apostle writes in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. You know, praise the Lord for godly special music, amen? You know, if I did the special music today, and instead of having a flute or a guitar, if I just had, um, as it says, a gong or a clanging cymbal, all right? And for special music, I was up there, and I would just hit that gong over and over and over again, same sound, over and over and over again. Would that be music? What would we call that? We would call it noise. The thing is, though you call yourself a Christian, though you call yourself a Seventh-day Adventist, if you have not love, you're only making noise. Do you understand that? Only making noise, brothers and sisters. Hmm. Continue to read verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. He says, look, though you understand the books of Daniel and Revelation, which are very important for this time, amen? Though you understand those books, if you have not love, you are nothing. See, we could understand who the Antichrist is and still have the spirit of Antichrist. Isn't that right? You can know who the beast is, 
but you could be a beast, <laughs> right? 